Okay. Um, great. So uh, this model we had spoken about a little bit in the morning. Um, it, uh, and I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, there we go. Uh, so uh, we had noted that this model had in it uh, related to the very definition of age-based modeling, one or more populations. Specifically, it had, if we go to Maine, double click on Maine, Maine is kind of the, the general global overall situation in which the model is model dynamics are placed. It's the overall context for the model. And we have three populations there population of people, a population of home, and a population homes and a population of clinics. Um, and the way in which it works here is that uh, each person is given, is placed in a random home. If you click on population, you'll notice that a population tells each person what to assume for that person's parameters. You may, some of you may remember, I said in any logic, the parameters encode values and they communicate values from the point of creation to the agent. And in this case, the point of creation is the population. And uh, as such, the population tells each person in it what their home is. It also tells it what their income is and, uh, and it draws their sex from a distribution. Um, so here we have a population of people and uh, we also have a population of homes uh according to a count of homes and a population of clinics according to a count of clinics as well um now uh in this case uh we're going to uh be focusing on the interaction between people's health state and the state of the clinic so uh, people's situation, if we got a person, this is our theory of personhood. This is our theory of what it means to be a person in this model. So to be a person in this model means that you're characterized by a sex, an income, and a home. So you have some sex, some income, and a home. We saw the population told each person what their sex, income, and home are. And, and then, they have some status with respect to infection here. Um, so with respect to their infection, they, uh, uh, they have some particular status and then they have some status with respect to seeking care as well. And I'm just frothing this a little bit to neaten it up. Um, so we have care seeking going on and uh, that care seeking reflects their infection status. We saw this before lunch but a person starts susceptible, they can be exposed to infection. If they are susceptible when they are exposed to infection, they'll go to an exposed state where they're infected but not infective. From that, after a certain amount of time given by an incubation period uh, as specified to Maine, um, up in Maine, they will proceed to a state where they're infective and symptomatic. Whilst in that state, they will transmit infections to nearby people according to a number of contacts they have per day. And after um, receiving treatment, if they receive a curative treatment, recovery in this model is assumed to be treatment mediated, meaning that people will not recover until they receive treatment. Um, you might think of it for something like uh, uh, gonorrhea, but but even more so that it's treatment dependent. You know, it depends on antibiotics being conferred, for example. Um, if they are conferred successful treatment, we call them cured and they go back to a susceptible state. Okay. Um, so this is a model which involves um, uh, them requiring treatment before they can be. Um, they can recover to a susceptible state, but when conferred that treatment, they become susceptible immediately again. Um, so, you know, you may give them antibiotics for their gonorrhea, but they go back into their networks in which there may be gonorrhea circulating and they're immediately susceptible to it. Now, 
Beyond that, we have this care seeking. And what's very important to understand is two things. First of all, they, um, in their care seeking capacity, oh, I'm sorry, am I sharing the right screen here, TAs? Am I are sharing the other screen? Which screen am I showing? You see the model. Okay, good, good. So they will only seek care if they, if this so-called guard condition is true. You don't have to worry about all the details of this. I'm giving those who wanna get a head start, a little bit of clues as to why this is working, but there's this thing called the guard. We're gonna be learning more about it this afternoon. But basically they start going to care if um, only if they are infective and symptomatic, only if they're in this state will they consider going to care. Only if it, you know, it's uncomfortable for them to pee, they'll they'll consider going to the STI clinic. They'll then be in transit to care, they'll arrive there. And when they arrive there, they will enter the clinic. That's what this nearest clinic dot walk and dot take is. So when they start going, they will find out the nearest SDI clinic. They'll get the nearest clinic and they'll remember it and they'll start moving there. And when they arrive, they will enroll in that clinic. Okay. Um, so this is a spatially explicit model where they're going to go to a nearby clinic. Um, and when they arrive there, they will enroll in that clinic. And by so doing, if we click on clinic, they will come in and they will start awaiting the attention of a healthcare worker. Um, perhaps it's an STI nurse, uh, perhaps it's a physician. We don't get into the, the differences between these disciplines here, although we do in other models, but they come in and if they receive timely treatment, they'll undergo uh, treatment and uh, that treatment will either be successful or it will be fail. Uh, it will fail. This little diamond indicates that it fails or it succeeds with a probability of treatment as given by a parameter in Maine. So they come down here. If it's successful treatment, um, they will, uh, and and you could see it here. If it's successful treatment we send them a message saying you are cured. Uh, if it's unsuccessful, they're, they're not going to be cured. They will remain afflicted and they will proceed here to leave. If they're waiting in this state for too long, and if you go down and, and look at this a little bit more, um, you'll notice that there's a timeout in this advanced area of this block for 300 minutes, that's five hours. If they don't receive treatment in that time, we could of course make it in person dependent or we could make it based on severity. But here, if they don't receive treatment in five hours, that's 300 minutes in this advanced area, they will leave, okay? They will leave and they will leave without being seen they will leave without being treated. And what does that mean for uh, public health? If, if this person who's awaiting, say, STI treatment for gonorrhea leaves without being seen because the waiting time is too long, what's the implication, the risk for public health? There'll be more cases. There'll be more cases because they may go out, they won't have been successfully treated. They'll left without being seen by a physician or by a, a, a STI nurse. They'll go out into the population and they may engage in behavior that spreads the infection more because they've stayed infected. If they receive timely treatment, they can be cured from their infection and, and they may go back into a high risk situation by which they could be exposed again, but at least they won't be carrying it with them out of you know, going back home. Um, so this is a model that involves looking at the interaction. And I partly wanna emphasize this because of the interest here among some folks expressed interest on your surveys, the interaction between formal care, formal care processes, health care system, on the one hand and public health on the other. Um, this is a model that captures that in a very stylized way. We have people circulating within clinics and 
the timeliness of their care affects public health. It affects whether they're circulating with infection and public health. If they're not being treated quickly, a lot of more people are going to be circulating with infection than would otherwise. But public health situation affects the clinic because it drives people to the clinic, right? They only seek care in the event that they are they are um, infected and symptomatic, and they'll seek care then. So there's this feedback involved between uh, an individual's infection status and their presentation at the clinic. Uh, if, if they're infected, they may present at the clinic. If the clinic's too busy, they may stay infective, and there can be vicious cycles associated with that, where a large number of people in the population are infected, waiting times in the clinic are high, they remain infected because they're not getting treatment conferred in a quick time. They're circulating more, more people get infected, et cetera. A model like this is designed to capture this, this vicious cycle. Psych feedbacks like that are one of these hallmarks, one of these features of complex systems. They routinely have reciprocal causality. Yes, public health affects clinics, but clinics affect public health in this case, okay? This model will illustrate several other features of complex systems. Features of those systems will be captured by the model and properties of the systems that result. Sort of the nature of, of the complex systems gives rise to emergence, but also things like tipping points, path dependence, and, and lock-in effects. So let's see this. So here we have, here we have a theory of sorts. And uh, we have clinics, and we have people, and we have interaction between people and the clinics, H&H &H and interaction, and uh, inter H&H and, -H and interaction with people in clinics and with people and people by sending messages you know, by spreading infection to others, say by uh, SDI networks to nearby people. Okay, so let's enact this theory. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to go and go to the single clinic high illness hazard, okay? And I'd like you to run it. You did this before. Uh, I'd like you to, uh, to do it again here. And uh, pardon me, um, uh, that's, that's right, yeah. Okay, so we're going to run this model. And you may remember, we saw this model before lunch where our focus was something different. Um, hopefully not lunch. Uh, so here we have four people initially infected. And uh, here's the clinic shown up here. Okay, we have one clinic, hence the name of this scenario, high illness hazard single clinic. We're running this model, assuming one clinic, and we have a handful of people initially infected. This model has time units of hours, and uh, it can proceed a little bit slowly. So I'm going to speed it up by a factor of to about five times using this plus um, down here. And uh, you'll notice that these people have become infective. They've started to present to the clinic. That's why they're going up here. And if we go look at the clinic here, we'll find... We're gonna go down and look at the clinic from this box over here. Remember, if you don't see this, use this, uh, go down here, go to the clinic, and here we go. We could see so far, 10 people have come in, all 10 have proceeded through here, and all, all uh, now 11, 12 have been successfully treated and discharged. And the nurses here, uh, have only been operating about 5% their capacity. But it seems to be easing up, I mean, or, or sort of uh, increasing, I should say. I'm going to go back to the main model here. We're going to take a look at what's going on. We're still in a situation where the infection is at rather low levels. Uh, time is passing, and it may yet um, die out. Here we go. 
uh, times going on. We see people passing infection, getting getting infected. They're passing it to other people in their homes, but they're going and getting treatment at reasonably fast rates. So this is the utilization of the clinic. Remember, if the utilization gets high, people are going to be waiting a long time, which may mean that they're more likely to leave without being seen. And while waiting, they may infect other people while waiting for the call back for the STI clinic. I've sped it up to 25 times just to give us, give us a bit of a, a faster simulation. You'll notice that the utilization is climbing uh, together with the, um, the incidents here. So here we go. Uh, it's climbing up. And you notice it seems to be going a little bit higher. As we get more people infected, what is that going to do to the uh, to the STI clinic? If more people are getting infected, what's going to be going on with the STI clinic? The case yeah, the caseload will increase. More people will be coming in. Now it's been 620 people coming in. And there'll be a bigger load on the healthcare workers there, right? They'll be busy a larger fraction of the time. And guess what that means for a new person who comes in? They will be, or a new person is awaiting treatment. They may be what? Waiting for longer, right? Um, because the nurse is busy with, with other, other people, right? Um, so uh, time is going on here. Um, and the question is, is this clinic going to be able to handle it? Um, we could see it kind of putters around for a while. Remember, these systems are stochastic, right? Um, there's a chance that it, it may pull out of this by stamping out the infection in time. So it kind of, that's around it. Then, aha, what just happened? Anyone want to conjecture? Let's, let's go look at the clues. It's like a game of clue, right? Let's go see what happened and we're going to figure out if, you know, what, who done it? What, what happened to drive this? So first of all, the illness count is through the roof. We have massive numbers of people infected and getting infected. The prevalence and the incidence is high. And Wade, you can remind me, is this showing uh, prevalence or incidence, this graph? Um, you've told me before, but I, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, actually, I, I should probably show them how to do this. So. Um, I'll go here, I'll go see illness count. It's based on prevalent case count, okay. Um, in baseline, I, I went and checked that particular graph in the model in Maine is drawing its value from prevalent case count, case close. Okay, let's go look at this. So the number of people in the model who have, who have, who are prevalent cases, prevalent case count is through the roof. It's over a thousand. What's that doing to the clinic? This is the utilization graph. What do you think is going on at the clinic level? Anyone? Do you think the nurses are busy or not? Yeah, busy. busy. <laughs> um, they are busy indeed. Let's go, let's go check what's going on besides them being busy. Can anyone else anticipate something else that might be going on besides them being busy? Here, here's the clinic, a bustling place but a troublingly bustling place. Well, I mean, the of treatment okay, we could capture that, but indirect, sort of. Um, right now, we don't have uh, pressure-based impacts on probability of treatment success, but what we do have is people without leaving without being seen. People who say, look, I've been on this, I've been waiting for this FBI clinic, you know, for... For weeks now, um, they're they're circulating infective still, and they may essentially, you know, uh, give up on on getting treated. And you'll notice that there's massive numbers of people. This is this um, uh, this uh, number up here who have actually left without being seen now compared to the number that have actually been treated, which is about 37,000 or so. 
and the healthcare workers are 85% of their capacity. So ladies and gentlemen, um, what we're what we're seeing here, and I'm going to go back to the main model here by clicking on this. What we're seeing is an overload of the health health care system and the public health situation. We're seeing very large numbers of people circulating ill, overwhelming the care processes, which means that they're not getting diagnosed and treated in time, and therefore they're circulating more ill yet. And it's spiraling, right? It's a vicious cycle. The more people get infected, the slow, the more present for care, the slower things are at the clinic, the more people get infected. There's a feedback here. Again, one of the, the hallmarks of complex systems. It's an adverse feedback in this case that's driving the system into overload. Now, I want to show you something that um, uh, points us to a way forward. Incidentally, this uh, graph up here shows the number of times each person have gotten infected. We're getting people infected, you know, 45 times over the course of these uh, 45,000 hours. Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, so that was a single clinic, okay? Um, and I'd like to run it now with uh, two clinics, okay? Two clinics here. You'll notice that um, with, with that single clinic, we went up and virtually all of the population was, uh, the, the large majority of the population was uh, infected. Um, so now we're going to do it with two clinics from the start. What do you think that will, will, will change in the model? Suppose we have two clinics. What do you think will, will change? Anyone? Two clinics from the start. Anyone? Healthcare capacity will increase. Healthcare capacity will increase. And why is that important for public health? Because they'll be able to, yeah, they'll be able to treat them in a timely fashion. And if this is a treatment mediated recovery situation where they're not going to recover unless they're treated, that may make a big difference in terms of reducing the, you know, uh, of reducing the number of people that are circulating infected, right? We're going to be we're going to be treating people sooner, hopefully before they spread it. We're going to be conferring timely treatment. So let's see what's going on. You know, here we're looking at two clinics. I'm going to speed it up, and you can see the clinic utilization is once again uh, trending upward. We seem to have a large number of people getting infected, and it's sort of dithering around until it again has gone adverse. Was two clinics enough to stop this from getting really bad? No. It got really bad despite two clinics. Did it help? Yeah, it helped initially, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to stop it. But did it peak in a, uh, a little later? Well, it is, it, it may have peaked a little later. You might have bought more time. And we can look at that. Looking at that closely would require running the model a bunch of times. And we'll get into how to do that later this week. We'll, we'll be able to look at that sort of issue. Right now, it's it's a bit outside of our scope for, for today. But it might have bought some time, and I bet it did. So it, it on average, it's going to buy quite a bit more time and let the health system prepare. Right, um, potentially to handle this. We've seen that movie before, right? Um, okay, now let's try three clinics. I don't know why this is called single clinic high illness has it three clinics. It's really three clinics. I don't know why it says single clinic. I ignore that first single clinic. So we're gonna try three clinics. You'll notice here if we click on it, it says count clinics three. The first one had count clinics one, uh, the, the one we just ran at Punk Clinics 2, this is three clinics, ladies and gentlemen, three clinics from the start, um, which are providing care, treatment services to the community. TAs, please watch the chat. I know I know that there's uh, chat, chat activity that's reported to me, so I just want to be sure that's, that's being monitored. Um, okay. Um, 
Oh, I see. Okay, it doesn't look like anything problematic. It looks like TAs are, are doing a great job. Okay, so I am I'm going to be simulating it here with three clinics. So the clinics initially are at low capacity, and well, it doesn't seem to be taking off quite yet. Uh, in fact, it seems that the prevalence is going right around right around one or two people, and then it died out. Do you see that? Do you see it died out? And then the clinic utilization, this is an average over time, so it's going down and down. Let's try that again. Maybe that was just a fluke. Here we have our three clinics, and we're going to run it again, and we'll see if, if it dies out again. So here we go. Okay, we're going to run and it died out again. Once again, it disappeared. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, you can try it one more time. And suffice it to say that indeed, it's going to be fairly stable that three clinics is enough to handle this initial load without getting into that death spiral, without getting into that vicious cycle whereby Infection breeds delays, breeds slow treatment, breeds circulation infective, and breeds more infection. Um, so here we are. It, it starts out. There's always a few people up front, but it snuffs it out. That's a robust healthcare system response. Do you see that? So this is path dependent. It, it actually matters a lot how many clinics we have up front. It's not that this model always goes to the same fate, that it's always fated to have very large numbers of people sick or health system overload. It depends a lot what the characteristics are of that health system up front. One clinic versus three clinics makes all the difference. So. But realistically, that won't usually happen because yeah. you usually have the number of nurses that you usually need. Yes. But when you have an outbreak, then you already reached out to like, let's say 75% of capacity, you can still have to take 10 times. Then where three clinics scenario would be right. Actually, it could be an effect. Okay. I love hearing this discussion. We're going to look at a scenario where exactly this issue starts to come in, where, where it's an issue of, of maybe you start to get an outbreak before you're fully staffed up, and then you need to staff up in response to that outbreak. Well, let's go see that, because some insights will come. But I, I want to highlight that what we're seeing here has tipping points in it. You can have different outcomes. We're not always fated for overload. It's not always written in the stars that we're going to have overloaded health system with too many people sick. What we've seen here is depending on our, our assumptions about the model, it can happen, it may not happen. It depends here on the balance of treatment resources and, and individuals and some bits of luck, whether it sticks or not. But for the most part, it's, it's based on that balance. But I want to build on Saab's point. I want to try running this and, and let the... Let the let a um, uh, a outbreak start, and then let's try to respond to it. Okay, so we're going to run now single clinic high illness hazard. We're going to run that scenario again. Do you remember this one? It's a single clinic. Do you expect this to die out, or do you think it will take off in terms of? high high load on the system and high number of people infected. Do you remember with a single clinic what's going to happen? It's going to be it's going to be over capacity and overloaded. That's right. Um unless by chance you get people recovering very very early on and and you know you you just dodge the bullet. But um just because of the small numbers involved. But uh it's unlikely. Here we go. We don't know exactly when the transition will go. You notice it dithers around for a little bit. It seems to be kind of keeping up with it. It looks looks like it has a chance and so on. Um, and and we're running it at a hundred times speed here. It's it's zipping along. 
but overall the load seems to be going up. Load on health workers, the load on number of people who are ill right now, which drives more people to the clinic. The clinic is getting slower. It's leading people to circulate more and it's dithering around, but it, then at some point it just goes ballistic and it's going to, it's going to end up um, spreading to, to very large numbers. As long as it's, you know, very small numbers, there is always a tiny chance that it will die out. But um, uh, right now the odds are against it. And what we're seeing is a bit of stochastic uh, chance events before what will likely be an adverse transition. You'll notice sometimes it takes a bit longer, but it seems to be getting in dangerous territory. And there, do you see the transition? Yeah. Okay, so, so bad things have happened. <laughs> we're, we're in a bad situation. Let's try to fix it, okay? Let's try to go fix, you know, uh, pick up the pieces here. We're going to staff up. We're going to engage in surge staffing. We're going to get some extra devotion of resources to this. The emergency is upon us. We're going to respond to it. Let's go add some clinics to, to this. So see this button? I paused it here. I, I paused it, and I'm, I'm going to say add clinic. Do you see that button that says add clinic? Right now, you'll notice there's one clinic, and it's right here kind of at the epicenter where all these people are, are facing around. I'm going to add another clinic. And you'll notice this count clinics should change. Now we have two clinics there. Do you see that? One was here, one was here. Can we, can we run it with these two clinics? I'm going to continue to run it. What difference, do you think two will drive it out? Will two drive it out? Okay, it will maybe decrease it. Will it, will it drive it back into, okay, it decreased it. Yeah. The number of prevalent cases is smaller. The, the load doesn't look that much better. Um, I'm running this as fast as I can, and, and it's still very high levels. It doesn't look like, does this look like a healthy population? No. Does this look like a healthy utilization of nurses in the clinics? No. Still pretty bad. If we go look at the clinics, well, now we have two clinics, but, okay, this says one, but uh, if I pause it, I'd probably see the, the two here. Um, uh, so we have clinic zero, which is our original clinic, and here's the other clinic. And the bulk of the people have balked, have, have left, and it's at 99% capacity. That new clinic is um, is hurting, it's, it's, it's just overloaded. The physicians are overloaded. The nurses are overloaded. The system's overloaded. We're, we're in an adverse situation. Let's add the third clinic. Remember, three clinics was enough. Remember that? When we had three clinics up front, remember that? It was enough? Okay, let's add the third clinic. Ready? Are we, get, are we ready to see a revolutionary change? Okay, so here's one, two, and here's the third one. Do you think you're going to see a, a dramatic change? Uh, doesn't look too dramatic, does it? Uh, um, so does this look like a good utilization ratio? No, it's still pretty bad. But this was three clinics. This is three clinics. We Didn't we see before three clinics is enough? What's different here? It's a good idea, but it turns out it's something much simpler than that. Yes. Uh, All right. So while we are seeing case doubling time is reducing, why wouldn't we add two clinics instead of one? Uh, sorry. So you're saying, uh, why did we add two? Or no, I'm just saying we are just increasing it by one. We're just increasing it. We've increased it to three now, and it's still not enough. And the truth is that it's gotten... So if you had these three clinics at first, you can keep up with the volume, right? Remember at first, there's very few cases. 
So you can keep up with that volume and you can snuff it out. You, you treat them soon enough that they don't, it doesn't spread widely. But if the infection gets established at very high levels, three times isn't enough. And that's what I'm saying. So case doubling time is stayed about the same. Like yes, the that's right. So that, why wouldn't we double the clinic? That's right. Okay, so let's go to four clinics. Surely four, right? I mean, if we had three before, surely four would be enough. Does it look enough? No, it's still at very, very high levels. 99, it's gone down from 99.4% to 99%. Uh, so yes, yeah, Saab's point is quite right. The doubling time is too small. It's, it's still multiplying very quickly. Let, let's, how about five clinics? Is five clinics enough? Doesn't look like it. Um, five clinics. Three was enough to prevent it from taking off. But if you're dealing with it after the fact, it's taking so far five clinics and it's still not dying out because the clinics are already overloaded. The case volume is so high, five clinics aren't nearly enough. Here's six clinics, ladies and gentlemen. The, the load is going down, but we still don't see a game-changing situation in terms of the load. Right? Here we're trying seven clinics. Let's try seven. We have three that headed off but to deal with it after the fact, to deal with it once it's established, is an entirely different matter. We're we're seeing we're seeing such high volumes that three clinics isn't nearly enough, right? Um, we're we're seeing a need for much more resourcing to bring it down. Now, we are getting lower clinic utilization, but it's still way high up. It's still, you know, in the 80s. I'm going to try eight clinics. Okay, eight clinics is, well, it's getting better for sure. Um, it's, 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 it's brought it down a lot, but it somehow still is not. Let's try, let's try nine clinics. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. No, okay. No. Okay. So. We we're able to finally keep it at very, very low levels comparatively. It's still higher than it was at the beginning, but we are we we've got it down to to fairly low levels where it actually has a chance of going extinct. Notice this is like ten people. Aha! What what happened just then? It went extinct in the population. So what's going on here, ladies and gentlemen? There's an old saying. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. There's another saying, stitch in time saves nine. These are reflections of, you know, an underlying bit of wisdom that there's a lot of cases when you're dealing with complex systems where it's a lot easier to head a problem off if you intervene early, aggressively, and with prevention, than it is to pick up the pieces later and remediate it. Once a problem is established, it's often a lot harder to, to effectively deal with it than if you can head it off in the first place. It takes a lot more resources. In this case, something like nine clinics, three times as many as we needed to head it off in the first place. And if we think about it, there's a lot of situations like that in the world. It's a big mess to deal with if it goes bad, but if we can prevent it from going bad, we can do so for a lot less resources. Um, substance use and addictions are one of these situations where, right, if, if a person gets caught up in, in, in substance use uh, challenges, often, you know, helping them work through that and, and escape from it takes much more, much more effort than would be required to to prevent those issues. And I would submit to you, to those here, that there's a lot of conditions with childhood infectious uh, 
uh, diseases uh, that could be headed off for cheap vaccinations, but can be really dangerous if they they catch them in, in uh, their teenage years, for example, or adverse childhood experiences, um, mental health issues with trauma, where if you can head it off, you can do so, you can head it off with a lot less resources than it takes to treat it once it's established. And this is an example. This is called technically a lock-in effect. We see a situation where it gets locked into a situation and the ability to escape that situation requires, to escape it requires much more resourcing, much more effort than it would have taken to avoid it having come about in the first place. This is very emblematic of complex systems. You know, um, picking up the pieces after the fact is so much more painful and resource intensive than preventing it um, in the first place. Um, the sad truth is, of course, as you know, a lot of people will find it hard to imagine the situation coming about and will demand to see it before acting. <laughs> and that's where you get the problems because the resources needed to to remediate then are so much more than, than were the case at the beginning. So some examples of complex system phenomena here, ladies and gentlemen. Emergent behavior. What you see up here is emergent behavior. Um, tipping points where it can die out or it can kind of muddle around at low levels or take off. Path dependence where it goes to very different outcomes based on vagaries of you know how many resources, the balance of resources in place compared to the people needing care. And then lock-in effects where it requires much more resources later to deal with the situation once it's developed than it would take to head it off. This is a model which illustrates all of those. It also illustrates feedbacks. Um, there's delays here, delays in going and seeking care when someone's infected, delays in conferring care. And it turns out there's nonlinearities. Not only does a person have to be willing to seek care, but also there needs to be a care professional who can treat them. Uh, and it turns out that, that, that interventions like resourcing with clinics have non-additive effects. Uh, if you if you add the benefits of one clinic to the benefits of of, of that of another of, of one clinic, you don't get the benefits of two clinics. It it doesn't it doesn't work that way. That it's it translates into linear effects. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is a model which illustrates some of those features, and I have provided you in the course um, site here uh, with some hallmarks and induced properties of, of complex systems. We've talked, I just referred to feedbacks, nonlinearity, delays, um, and we've seen emergence, tipping points, path dependence, uh, lock-in effects here uh, in ways that lead to policy resistance, lead to investments that just don't pay off um, uh, at, at smaller scales and which require a certain level of investment to achieve a tipping point, to achieve a situation where the infection goes from high levels to, to dying out or at least to low levels. So when we have complex systems, and, and, and it could be in, in uh, waiting times for emergency services and, or balances between hospital and you know, acute care and community services, or it could be between um, with with uh, communicable diseases like here, or mental health issues and, and issues of substance uh, substance use, um, these issues uh, play a huge role. And it's hard to find a big challenge that society faces on the health front, social front, that isn't marked by these features, that isn't marked by these basic challenges because those are the ones that are hard to, to deal with, hard to, hard to, um, to affect um, uh, sustainable change. So if we want to put in place, um, uh, want to put in place fixes that stay fixed, 
we have to grapple with these challenges of complex systems. We don't have much choice. They face us as fundamental features of these systems we've wor we're working with, and we need the tools like we're developing in this boot camp to address those problems. So that was a bit on, on complex systems. Um, I wanna pause now, and uh, maybe we'll stop the recording here before we get on to some model building. And I wanna ask if there